Are you interested in increase in any area of your life? Uh, maybe you say, well, who isn't? Well, somebody could be so successful, so prosperous that they say, I, I'm fine just like I am. I don't want any more. So I guess that pro- this program wouldn't be for you if you're in that category. But if you are the kind of person to say, I want increase. Today we're going to talk about the relationship between increase for you and your comfort zone. You'll not want to miss this. God's love, elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. Well, that's exciting. Uh, Today I'm looking forward to our telecast and what we are dealing with. I'm really talking about living in your cycle of increase. We're going to talk about that, and and it's going to be very, very fascinating. But first of all, I want to tell you that no matter what the topic is, we are here for you, to help you, to pray with you, to believe God with you. We're trying to teach from the Bible and from the revelation of Jesus Christ what He has done for us. And, And then we pray. We believe God for the miraculous. So maybe you just need a miracle. Maybe you're in a crisis. You need a miracle. Well, call the Grace Prayer Center, and also you can call there to be a part of what we're doing around the world. But right now, without any further delay, I'm going to the teaching, Living in Your Cycle of Increase. Isaiah 9, 7 says about Jesus that of his, of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. So that means that Jesus' kingdom and his peace It just keeps ever increasing. Then Isaiah 51, 2, it says about Abraham, look to Abraham, your father. I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Notice those two words, blessed and increased. There's no such thing as as being blessed without increase. Increase always follows blessing. Leviticus 26, 9, I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. God's favor. What does it mean? It means fruitfulness, multiplication, and God's covenant becomes real in our lives. These are powerful scripture verses. Another one, Mark 4, verse 8. Other seed... Speaking of the gospel, the revelation of Jesus being the seed, fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced. Some 30-fold, some 60 and some 100. So notice again, increased and produced. There's a tangible effect. It's not just, oh, you know, God's increased. No, it produces something. How many want some good things to be produced in your life? Uh, That's God's plan. Then it says, Jesus is our example. He says in Luke 2.52, Jesus increased, increased in wisdom and stature and in favor. So if Jesus increased, we are the followers of Jesus. Our destiny is also increased. Acts 16.5. Churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. So be, to be strengthened in the faith is not just as, oh, I'm strengthened. Oh, you know, I feel so spiritually strong. And then nothing happens. No, they increased in numbers daily. I heard one yes to that. And then we have a sort of a command really in Colossians 2, 1, 2 19 where it says, increase. Go ahead and increase with the increase that is from God. One more scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, 7. Neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So we would be spinning our wheels, you know, if we just watered and planted, but God gives the increase. And, And I'm saying God has been speaking to each of us as individuals and to us as a church. That we are in a season of prolonged 
escalated and accelerated increase. We learn from these verses that life in fellowship with God means increase. It's just, it's no such thing as not increasing and in saying that we know the Lord because life with God means increase. Now, I put a very ambitious title, if you wish, on this, um, on this uh, series of teaching. I call it Living in Your Cycle of Increase. Look at the title I put there, Living. So I'm not saying having an occasional increase or, or visiting in the area of increase. I'm talking about living in it. And I'm making it personal. I'm not talking about somebody else. I'm talking about your cycle of increase. I'm talking about you living not, 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 there's a cycle, there's a rhythm, there is a flow to it. And and I'm talking about increase. That doesn't mean being successful or prospering. Two different things. To increase and have success is two different things. See, you can be very successful very successful. And you're enjoying your success and prosperity. You say, wonderful. And you said, this is it. This is good enough. I'm successful. I'm prospering. We could say, our church, look at this. Almost every chair is taken this morning. I see one, two, three, four. A few chairs here and there. It looks full. We could say, we're doing good. What a lovely church we have. Oh, yes, what a lovely. So, so we could say, we, we're successful, but So being successful is not the same as increase. I'm not teaching about a cycle of success. So if you're a person who says, well, I got enough. No more, thank you. I'm fine. I don't want to. I'm just doing good. Don't hassle me. I'm fine. Well, this series of sermons are not for you. But if you individually, where you find yourself in your life, you say, I want a little bit more. I want a little something a little greater. I want to grow. I am talking about not being successful and prosperous merely, but I'm talking about increasing. Everybody say increase. Increase. Are you ready for this? All right. So again, I was deeply moved last Sunday morning when Pastor Nathan, the lead pastor in this church, was preaching. I was very moved. And in fact, some of the message I'm preaching today is kind of a, you know, pivoting off what he shared. And if you weren't here, I was very moved. I was very moved about several services uh, that I have enjoyed this fall. I, I believe God is talking to us. And I, I want to say when, there, when there's a stirring, let's move forward. Let, let's, t- let's, let's take the opportunity because everything that has life increases. Have you noticed that? The grass grows. Even the universe is expanding, scientists tell us. There's no place in the universe where it says, the end. No, it's expanding. Everything about God is increase. God is not some small little Jesus. I was joking with someone saying, people pray, oh, dear little Jesus, if you can help me. There's nothing little about Jesus. Our God is awesome. Our God is a God of increase. Our God is a God of growth. Now, I want to introduce us to something else here, and that is, we're all familiar with this, and it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, so don't get nervous, it's called our comfort zone. Our rate of increase is in relation to our comfort zone. Now, I want to tell you something, to have a comfort zone is a good thing. Even Pastor Nathan told us last week about his favorite pillow. You know, your favorite pillow makes you feel comfortable. Now, thank God he, he graduated from one pillow to a new pillow. <laughs> it, it was a struggle, you know, it was a struggle. But I, I want to say, because you may have heard teachings about step out of your comfort zone. Well, you know, frankly, all of us need to live in a comfort zone. You know, but you're comfortable where you're working. Imagine me having to get up here and preach and feel uncomfortable every time. No, I like being with you. You're nice people. I like being here. You're receptive. You're loving people. And I hope you feel like that. That's why we want our church. We, we want to feel welcome. We have like get together dinners and connect and everything because we want to feel comfortable. We want to feel not ill at ease. So, 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 so comfort zone is very, very important. And so I say our comfort zone is necessary. If you want to put down some points, it's necessary. 
It's, it's a good thing. You know, it's so funny. I, I, when I travel around the world, I bring people with me from different countries. You know, Americans, they love their Starbucks coffee. And they go to Africa. They go to Ethiopia, to Kenya, countries that produce coffee. And they're bringing bags of Starbucks. Then Canadians are bringing bags of Tim Hortons coffee. I say, leave the Tim Hortons coffee at home. They actually have coffee in Africa. But, 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 you know, it gives you a sense of comfort. I want my little Tim cup. I do so much com- promotion, they should pay me, really, uh, Tim Hortons, you know. Uh, 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 people like comfort like that. A comfort zone. I liked it. The other day, I was coming out of my office, and one of our prayer ministers were there, right? And she said, oh, oh, Pastor Peter, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. And she said, you know, I'm getting so many phone calls from all over Canada. People just love your teaching. They just love you. I said, bring it on, sister. Tell me more. She said, not just one call. You did you said, many calls. They call, oh, they love you. It's changing. The-. I said, bring it on. I feel good. Come on. Don't you like that? Don't look at me so funny now. I said, can you tell me more? Are they still coming in, the calls? Nothing wrong. So our comfort zone, I even put, it is, our comfort zone is where we thrive. In your business, you're familiar, you have your clientele, you have your sales quotas, and you kind of know how to meet those sales quotas, and you know the main customers, and you visit them once a month, or you call them up, and you know, it's kind of, it's kind of nice. So everybody say, I love my comfort zone. <laughs> oh, I love it. And, and, and your home. I love going home because nobody tells me where to sit. And I'm comfortable. And I, I, I just, you know, Tyna and I have a good life. We just, don't you love being comfortable? Some of you want to go to sleep right now. I just keep talking about this. You're getting, you, you, you're, almost, you're almost dozing off here. But, oh, it's beautiful to be comfortable. But here is a fact. Our comfort zone limits us. As nice as it is, it limits us. You know, some people, when it comes to their education and knowledge, they reach their maximum comfort zone at about somewhere between 15 to 20. Everything they learn, they learn by 50 to 20, and they don't go on from there. They know exactly to do their job, and they, if they're a teacher, they teach the same courses, and they, they, they listen to their favorite radio station, and they listen to, they watch their favorite television that reinforces whatever they already believe. And, and so as beautiful as the comfort zone is, it's a little dangerous. See, the key to increase is to expand your comfort zone. Make your comfort zone bigger. Learn to see bigger things. Think bigger. If you, want to, if you want to get a promotion in the company you work for, find out how you can be a, contribute in a bigger way. What else can you do to contribute? Expand your comfort zone. And, and here we come to the, the point. Psst, faith, faith, the faith God gives us is what makes us step out of the comfort zone until that zone has been expanded. Look at this. It's on the screen right there. Faith steps out of the comfort zone. Now, now that's people say, step out of the comfort zone. Yeah, I can step out a little bit, but I don't want to live outside my comfort zone. But keep stepping out until your zone has expanded. So if your zone was this big, I'm walking in a circle right now, you step out a little bit. And they said, I'm going to go back to where I was. No, I step out again. And you step out again, and suddenly you know, oh, it's a bigger circle. And then when you get comfortable in that circle, I think I'm going to step out again. I said, no, no, I don't want to do that. I want to pull back. He said, well, I step out again and again. I'm hey, it's getting bigger. Well, we're going to go back to that teaching in just a moment. And I'm going to talk about what is the motivating factor that gets us to expand our comfort zone. What, what, you know, it could be ambition, it could be determination, it could be being strong-willed, and, and, and those things may help you a little bit. And I'm going to talk about what really, really causes us to step out of our comfort zone. And as you make that comfort zone bigger, because you don't want to live outside your comfort zone, you want to just make it bigger so that you're comfortable in a much bigger area. But before we go to that, I want to remind you that today, I haven't been mentioning this now for, I don't know, for weeks, but I want to give you the opportunity to receive our booklet that has blessed 
tens of thousands of people across Canada and also in other parts of the world the himself booklet that I know is going to encourage you. It's yours just for the asking. And there's a very special phone number just to receive that book written over 100 years ago. Uh, and, and there's a special number. It's not the regular Grace Prayer Center number. It's a special number. So note it right down there and call in and we will have this out the door uh, it, within 48 hours, it will be in the mail being sent to you. And so uh, avail yourself of that. But right now, let's go back to the teaching. What makes us step out of our comfort zone? What, what makes us go for it? Well, the thing is this, it's the faith of God in us. And you see, all the people in the Bible, how many know there's some heroes in the Bible? All of them have one thing in common, from Noah on down to Abraham David and Solomon and Elijah and all of them, they pushed their boundaries. They enlarged their territory, every one of them, to the apostles. So faith makes us increase our comfort zone. Go further, all right? I, I thought of one story that really blesses me. These are four unnamed individuals. We call them the four lepers. I mean, how would you like to go down in history as one of the four lepers? These people, obviously being a leper, meant in the thinking of the people that you were condemned by God and really weren't much useful for anything. Plus, you had the physical sickness. Now, the context is, that there was a famine in the city of Samaria. And it was a bad famine because the fam city was surrounded by a Syrian army and, and so people had no food and there was no produce coming into the city. So people were desperate, even eating one another. And everything was super expensive. And so somebody prophesied and said, in 24 hours, bread is going to be so cheap you're going to be able to buy loaves of bread so cheap. And one guy who stood and listened said, I tell you, if, if windows open in heaven and loaves of bread came raining down, it could never happen. And then they said to him, well, you, you're going to see it, but you won't even get to taste it. And so this is the situation, a desperate situation. And then the Bible goes forward. In the next verse it says, and there were four lepers. And they sat by the entrance to the gate of the city. And they said, we're going to die. And the other one says, yeah, that's right, Bubba. We're going to be dead. And the other one says, let's do something. So they say, if we sit here, we'll die here. And if we go towards the Syrian camp, we'll die there. So they say, what's the difference? Let's do something. And so they, they made a move. They stepped out. But, you know, it wasn't really a great stepping out because what, what, what was their choice? It's like when, you know, maybe... I hope this didn't happen to anybody in this church when your wife said to you, listen, baby, you helped me produce seven kids and you haven't had a job for seven years and we're going to lose the house. Get off your bum and off the couch and get out there and get a job. I don't care if they pay minimum wage and you kick them out of the house. And he said, I'm stepping out. It was kind of, he had to, isn't that right? He was saying, I, had, I, mean, I didn't have an option, right? I hope, I'm not talking about anybody here, of course, or anybody at all. I'm just saying, that wouldn't be a great step of faith, but never that, it would be like, I, I got to move or I'm dead. So let's not give them too much credit. So they're moving out, and then God takes that. How many are with me in the story? God takes that, these lepers walking, and amplify somehow the sound of their steps so that among the Syrians, it sounds like armies are marching. So they get scared and they run and leave all their food and all their porterhouse steaks and all their shrimp sandwiches and all their salmon and everything they had. They leave it and they run for their life. So the four lepers arrive then at the camp of this enemy army and what do they do when you're hungry? What do you do? You eat. So they go into the first food tent and they find gold and silver and money. So they pocket everything and they put money everywhere. And then they are eating, 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 eating. But you know how many know, even when you're really hungry, there's only so much you can eat. Is that right? So what they do, the Bible says, then when they get finished, let's go and check the next place. They go to the next place, more gold, more silver. They find everything and more food, more food. Bring it on, bring it on. Spare ribs, barbecued, honey, honey, Dijon mustard uh, sauce. And they just eating until they're just like, I can't move. <laughs> and 
And then one of them says, this is not right. We have a whole city that's starving. And we got gold and silver and food. And we, it's not right. We've got to step out again. This is the step out I like. When they could have hoarded everything and kept it for themselves, they say, we're going to step out again. We're going to go again, and we're going to tell everybody, come on, this is a smorgasbord. This is a free-for-all. Come and take all you want. And, of course, that famine ended, and it happened just like the prophet had said. Are you listening to me? I'm talking about TICC. I'm talking about our city of Toronto. You know that, that, that we are living in a very affluent city, but there's a spiritual famine in our city. Most people don't know that God loves them. Most people have a stereotypical view of God. They don't know how loving God is, how great God is. They don't know how good life could be. They don't know who Jesus really is. And we can sit and say, oh, it's so wonderful. You know, God is blessing us. And, oh, I just enjoy my church. Oh, praise the Lord. I just enjoy my church. You know, I want to worship. And let's go to a concert. And let's have another seminar. And let's have more fellowship. And meanwhile, we're just hogging everything for ourselves. And that is why I'm saying God is talking to our church. And he's saying it's time to step out. It's time to go forward. We have so many good things. You see, we are people of increase. You know, this story is about that God works with ordinary people. These are even nameless individuals. But something great happened when they stepped out in faith. You know, there are two kinds of people. I say there are people of increase and there are people who say, oh, it's just good enough. Just good enough. Just good enough. And I put it like this. People of increase. You know what, what, what signifies them? We keep learning. Everybody say keep learning. But the people who say, oh, it's good enough. They say, I already know everything. People of increase move forward in spite of their fears. I used to think some people have no fears. No, we all got fears. But what the love of God does, it's stronger than the fear. So we move forward in spite of our fear. But, but people who barely get by, they say, oh, oh you know, I, I just want to stay where I am. People have increased. They see opportunities. People who say it's good enough, they see obstacles. It's too hard. It's too impossible. People of increase, we are in life to win. Come on. Everybody say, I'm here to win. I, 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 they, should just, they just play so they don't lose. They're so careful. But we, we are people who step out. You know, why is it that people stay in their comfort zone? I think one reason is rationalizing. They say, well, I don't feel it's the right time. Or even ver worse, if you're really spiritual, I need to pray about it. But that's what you said five years ago. Yeah, but I forgot. I need to pray. Oh, come on, rationalizing. People say, well, it's not so important. Some people say to me, you know, money is not very important. I said, really? Well, give me all of yours then. <laughs> money, no, no. The only people who say money is no big deal are people who don't have any money. Don't look at anybody just say, money, as long as there are people hurting, as long as there are people who need to be reached, as long as there are people who need to be lifted, how can any person say money is not important when money can help people? But for, just for, I understand for ourselves, but, but, but money can live. So praise God, if you don't want it, give me yours. <laughs> you, you see, you see if, if we have that attitude, you never attract what you consider unimportant. If you consider money unimportant, you don't attract money. It's the same as it's, some people, you know, they said, oh, I want to, you know, I want to get married someday. And then I said, well, really, you want to? Well, they said, you know, getting a wife is not that important. Well, that's why you never got one. <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, getting a, well, you know, I don't really care. There's nobody in the church really. I, I don't really care anyhow. Well, don't worry. She's not coming. He's not coming. See, the people of Nazareth considered Jesus unimportant. Big deal, Jesus. And he couldn't do any great works there. So I like to appreciate things. What's another reason? Blaming. I'm a victim. We blame the government. We blame the economy. We blame our parents. Oh, that's a favorite one. <laughs> Don't worry. One day 
You'll be a parent. <laughs> we blame our coworkers, the upline and the downline. You know, blaming blinds us to opportunities. Remember the man at the pool of Bethesda who was lame for 38 years? Jesus is standing in front of him, the great healer, and Jesus says, do you want to be healed? He says, I, I, I don't have anybody to help me. Blaming all the world when the opportunity is standing in front of him. Complaining is another reason. You, you know, whatever we focus on expands, and complaining is a way of focusing. You're focusing on it. You focus on all your sins and troubles. You're going to do, have more of it. But if you focus on Jesus Christ and what he has done, you're going to find that all those negative things begin to dissipate. You see, birds of a feather flock together. Like attracts like. Complainers hang out with other complainers. Oh, life is so bad. The question is always, are we complaining because life is bad? Or is life bad because we're complaining? Oh, that, that went over. Somebody missed that. I said, are we complaining because life is bad? Or is life bad because we're complaining? Let's not take those pills. The pill of rationalizing. The pill of blaming. These are like temporary pain relievers. The pill of complaining. It killed the people of Israel. No, we are a people of increase. Oh, thank God. What, what makes us? As I telecast tomorrow, we're going to talk more about increase. I want to get into the cycle of it. There is a cycle, a rhythm of it, and you'll not want to miss that. In the meanwhile, I want to tell you God is for you. God is on your side. God has never turned his back on you. God has always loved you. He will never stop loving you. Go to the phone and call the Grace Prayer Center right now. There will be a prayer minister who wants to pray for you, to believe God with you. And then remember what I mentioned earlier, this booklet, yours for the asking and there's a special special phone number not the normal grace prayers phone number you see that special unique phone number that is now on the screen that is for this free gift i want you to have that i think it'll really really bless you and and it's not just that i want you to have it i think once you get it you'll want it. people come and tell me all the time this book changed my life they refer to it all the time. Some people say, I read it two, three, four times, and every time it speaks to me. So get a hold of that. And then now I'm in the closing moment here. Remember, God wants to give you increase. God has better things for you. And everything that has life grows and expands. I'm ready to believe God with you for your family, for whatever you need in your life. So let us know how we can pray for you. Remember, you are loved. Thank you. Your partnership makes this ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands who have never heard, call 1-877-974-7223. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at PO Box 2108, Vista, California, 92085-2108 or 190 Railside Road, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M3A183. Together, let's give everyone a chance to hear the gospel.